this week on the Back Table Podcast. Lifestyle is medicine, right? It's how do we encourage our patients and their families to understand it's not some perfect state. It's living with accountability and awareness and say, where can we make small changes one at a time so we can feel better? So we don't just truly believe that by going to a a lot of doctors, which is getting harder and harder for other reasons, you know, we're going to be okay and feel better. It doesn't happen like that. And I have to say I'm humbled by how many parents, moms, patients, especially those that are older, they really want to feel better. They say to me, no one's ever explained that to us. No one's ever told us we can do that. And that's really what has inspired me to stay in this space for all this time. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with a hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric ENT. I have a very special guest today, Dr. Julie Wei. As you, some of you already may know her from this platform, but Dr. Julie Wei is a pediatric otolaryngologist in Florida. She's currently the president of the American Society of Pediatric Otolaryngology, also referred to as ASPO. You may know Dr. Julie Wei from being a guest on Backtable ENT to being a host discussing better neck health, mentorship for wellness, to physician well-being. She routinely writes for ENT Today and has authored two books. A Healthier Way, W-E-I, and Acid Reflux in Children. Dr. Julie Wei is here to talk to us today about lifestyle medicine and pediatric otolaryngology. Welcome, doc- Dr. Julie Wei. It's so nice to have you today. Good morning, Gopi. Don't just call me Julie. You know, I, I it's know, so awkward. I'm like, Dr. <laughs> Julie Wei. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm like, stop being so formal, but I, I can't help it. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me as a guest today. I'm excited. You know, this topic is something that I'm passionate about. Absolutely. Happy New Year to you. Um, Let's get into it. So we talked to, uh, on Backtable ENT, episode 65, we talked to Dr. Jessica Lee on lifestyle medicine in otolaryngology, but it was predominantly focused on adults. So tell me what you think about lifestyle medicine for our kids, uh, for pediatric otolaryngology. Yeah. I have to say, first of all, thank you. That was a terrific episode. And in fact, thanks to you, I had the chance to connect with Dr. Lee, right, who lives in Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. And she and I met after that episode. We discussed how we shared this passion on a more holistic approach to health, right? Not replacing our training and everything that's evidence-based, but really for ourselves and our patients. So she explained to me and I love hearing her journey, as was shared on the episode of becoming board certified in this relatively new subspecialty. But I'm delighted to be on the show today. You know why? Because frankly, that board certification is all about adults. So children is not part of that. So I'm delighted to kind of share that even though I don't have a formal training, I am not a board certified, right, lifestyle medicine specialist. I am proud of the two decade experience through early recognition that we just can't fix every symptom by anoidectomy, TNA, and turbinate reduction, or even sinus surgery, balloon dilation. And and that's really what my journey's been about. Yeah, absolutely. I love that it's something that you picked up with your experience and along the way uh, with all the last 20 years. Um, Tell me a little bit about the milk and cookie disease. What is that? Yeah, those who know me, um, and they have the right to make fun of me a little bit. Um, (laughs) This was, I want to say, at the time I first, when I self-published A Healthier Way, that was the same time I came out with social media, website, platform, providing free information, education. And I coined the phrase because after about a decade, consistently seeing all these toddlers, preschoolers, right, they just come to you nonstop with Three things, chronic cough, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, right? And, and it's just, you're embarrassed to even mention the word virus again, right? right so right. I started really asking, you know, at first, anecdotally, then it just have gone to the point where every patient, I got a diet history with some focus specifics. And I noticed that in the Western, especially in America, this whole bedtime milk routine yeah. after infancy doesn't end. 
And because of all the decades of marketing, strong marketing for benefits of dairy, et cetera, right? Moms just have this emotional belief that it's good for them. And, and once we start eliminating bedtime milk, a lot of the symptoms went away. So that started that. And then the cookies part is really a term broadly more focused on sugar. So to sum it up, my informal self-learned lifestyle modification for children, focus on dairy, cal dairy consumption and timing of it, as well as sugar. And that's why it's called a milk and cookie disease. But just for fun, when this first came out, and I, w- I think I got picked up by the Daily Mail, there was a comment by British people, and sure in Europe, that said, why not the biscuits and crumpets? Or <laughs> they, they made fun of me. It's okay. I can take it. Well, I love the milk and cookie. I like the name. I think it's catchy <laughs> <laughs> and very specific. It, it fits the uh, bill here. So when we think of lifestyle medicine for our children, is it mostly dietary? Like, is that the main pillar in children? It is. Listen, I think you and I, as pediatric otolaryngologists, I don't know about you, I certainly gravitated at times being aware I act more like a pediatrician, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of counseling. Yeah. A lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, and that I think that's actually gives a lot of the families information, which they maybe haven't, they have already heard or maybe didn't hear or. It's just another, the same information from a different perspective sometimes is helpful too. I I think that's actually a very important part of what we do. I agree. And I'm going to be honest and say that becoming a mother was really what inspired me to even be more aware, right? Based on what I learned about my unconscious and conscious feeding behavior to my child, what I'm buying at the grocery store, what I put on the table, you know, that emotional when they eat eat, accept food, or refuse food when you fight over it. (laughs) I mean, there's a whole layer there. But back to your question, lifestyle medicine, just as the the board's the top, you know, certification and specialty, it's not just about one thing. So thanks for pointing that out. In my experience, diet is my key focus because I come back to being a pediatric ENT, right? Sleeping better is great, but will that eliminate your rhinorrhea and chronic cough? Probably not. So I declare to the universe, my goal is to help every family and their child avoid medication they don't need, avoid misdiagnosis, which is is huge. Can I just tell you, every cough is not asthma. Every runny nose is not sinus infection. You know how that goes, right? Yep. And and that is where I focus. But at the same time, though, let me tell you, yep, you don't want to see Julie Way unless you're going to get asked questions about sleep, physical yep. activity, because at the end of the day, I may never see them again. And this is for the rest of their life. Absolutely. So before we kind of get into exactly, you know, the diet and all that. So when the patients come in and see you or when you think in your mind, are you going through, does every kid kind of get a, let me kind of quickly go through your diet history, you know, how much physical activity do they have? What's their sleep like? Do you kind of, is that even for the kid that comes in maybe for the ear tube evaluation or, you know, just your OSA kids? I mean, when I think of the bulk of our patients that we would see in clinic, it's going to be sleep apnea and an ear tube evaluation, whether it's for it's an effusion or, you know, infections. But do you kind of apply that for every clinic visit? Well, that's a great question, right? So, I think it would make sense to you. And as I reflect, it's almost as if I wish somebody was videotaping me for an entire day. I apply a varying degree of it, depending on the history, the symptoms, the chief concerns or chief complaints, the medical comorbidity and things about the child. You know, you just inspire me. I need to write another book. okay? (laughs) so I can break it out. The medically healthy kids with something like right toddler daycare ear infection to the trach and G2 medically yeah. complex child, they are not the same. And yet I have found some aspect of, you know, this is, this is human beings, right? What goes in the mouth, this is what sustains us. They have impact. Timing and what goes in impacts how your, your body works, whether it's inflammation on the cellular level to, frankly, dairy and sugar is what contributes to they are ac- They're acidic once they're yeah. broken down. And then this is all tied to acid reflux in a two feet tall, you know, 18 inches tall toddler yeah. and how that manifests in the ENT symptoms. Yeah. So when I think of some of the most challenging ones, and, and you kind of go through it, you know, it's that chronic cough, chronic runny nose, just to kind of give our audience some specific 
examples. Um, and then you can kind of tell us how you use uh, the lifestyle approach for some of these patients. I mean, I think whether you do pediatric ENT or general or any ENT, it's going to even, if, you know, you're going to have, you know, the three-year-old with a chronic runny nose. It's just always running. They're otherwise happy and playing, but they just, it is always running. What's your, you know, how do you go through it in your head? Yeah, that's great. So <laughs> you and I both know, are you kidding me, right? There's never enough time. You got 10 to 15 minutes. You're already an hour behind in clinic. But, you know, this is not something that I just turned on overnight. So I would encourage our listeners, if you want to give this a shot, then my first thing is do no harm. We're being non-invasive. I want to remind the audience before I go into the detail, I very much am based on evidence and specifically guidelines, right? Um, I'm not out there to be some fad, fad diet or tell everyone to judge them and make them feel bad they choose to have cow milk. It's not about that, right? It's volume, timing. And so here, um, I love your example. Let's say a three-year-old comes in for chronic cough, nasal congestion, runny nose, by the way. <laughs> they, in PZ and t they usually, they rarely come in with one complaint. Have you noticed that? Yeah, no, no, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, uh, you're right. <laughs> Oh, it, it's one of those where you take a deep breath before you get started, right? This mom's trying to tell you they've had a sinus infection for 10 years. Whew, yeah. That's a whole other episode. <laughs> okay. that's it. So as I listen, the first part is let them tell me what bothers you the most. The first thing I do is differentiate, is this really acute or chronic? And as you know, 99.9% .9 is chronic, right? I ask them, are you still going to daycare? And do you have fever? 99%, no, I don't have fever. I just have chronic cough, blah, 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 even though everyone tells me this is the 12th virus. Then when it comes to the diet piece, these are my key questions. So even though we're not lifestyle board certified, anybody can ask them four or five questions. Total ounces of milk consumed in a day. So this is going to take a couple seconds because you're like having this mom kind of run through breakfast, lunch, dinner, right? And you do the math very quickly. And I, by the way, I document all this. What type of milk? Is a whole 2%, 1% or skim? Because per AAP guideline, if you want to, if we, let's say, truly adopt as biblical truth, you need the fat from the cow milk to finish myelination in the brain. Well, that's all great. But after H2, you just need 2%, 1% or skim, and you don't need more than 12 ounces a day. So I ask them how much total, what kind, and at what time? The one thing, if you don't, is bedtime milk. I just want to know, do you drink bedtime milk? And by the way, if you're nursing, I never influence or tell a woman she can't nurse before bed. That breast milk is not included here. And then the second question is sugary beverages. Okay, if you don't have the time to ask, do you eat, you know, donuts and chocolate chip cookies, you know, fine. But you, God, please, I'm begging all the listeners. When you take care of a child, find out how many, how many ounces in sugary beverages. Preschoolers, it's all focused, a lot of it on juice. School age and teenagers, you better believe I'm asking everything that's not water. My goodness, when you find out the discrepancy between the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines and what's actually consumed. And finally, this is something that I just added this decade. Yogurt products. Go B, I just want to put you on the spot as a mom, right? Like, do you think, have the perception in America? Is yogurt a good or a bad for you? I feel like in moderation, it should be okay. Um, it you know, should it, be. The yogurt products is a great point because it does make me think of the little yogurt drinks that my kids like to drink. I mean, they don't eat a lot of yogurt out of the cup per se, yeah. but it's all those yogurt drinks that they like. So thank you. So let's think about this as, a, for example, the Mediterranean diet was voted once again, best diet in the world, right? And we know the Greeks, if you, they have homemade yogurt and Indian culture, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Homemade mm -hmm. yogurt. Yep. But I want to tell you the reason I started asking was I noticed significant association between yogurt products I'm not talking about the homemade Greek and Indian and, and the French right. and whatever's organic or healthy. I'm talking about this is a mega industry. I was blown away when I found out, for example, this, this is a hundred, estimated to be 167 billion, not million, billion dollar industry in 2023 with expected growth, right? to 7% continually till 2027. And when I started being that, you know, weirdo who's reading, looking at the nutrition food label, reading all about yogurt, and you know what was new this decade is those pouches. Have you seen those infant 
yeah. yogurt pouches. Just, with, yep. yep. So it turns out, my gosh, it's almost like humans, we can't chew food anymore. It's convenient. Baby infants in your office will suck that down, right? Yep. Along with their Capri Sun pouches. You know? yes. so, yeah. One of the things I noticed was significant coral clinically. If we just eliminate or limit that, and especially those tubes that you suck down, the yeah. drinks, the ones with candy toppings. I mean, oh, yes. go, uh-huh, you come on. It goes on and on. And once we did that, guess what went away? A lot of the cough that the albuterol and all the steroid treatments weren't helping. I mean, and, and then it just depends. You might think I'm that weirdo, but there's a book called The Bliss Point uh, uh, called Sugar, Salt, and Fat that talks about if you really get into it, what is inside yogurts that are not digestible. Mm-hmm. But I'll stop there. <laughs> So we are the example was uh, that of a three year old child. Is yeah. or is this sort of question set the same for like the ten year old or the ten month old? And are you having how do you kind of break those kids up, if you will, and what you're thinking for that sort of chronic runny nose? Yep. So so that's a great question. So I'll give you an example. The three year old, right? I'm gonna ask because I learned to. Are you at home or you go to school? Who is in charge of the feeding? Right. Yeah. You know, dinner's at home, but if you're at school, are you making lunch or is the school providing it? But right. if I, I very quickly, this is kind of funny. Gopi, you know what's happened to me? <laughs> I can guess what is in their home and their pantry based on their symptom. I know that sounds super crazy. So give me an example. Because... Well, because well, well, sometimes the mom, I'll say, huh, what kind of snacks? You know, after asking, there are times when I'll just say, let me guess, do you eat gummy snacks? Do you have go-gurt and drinkable? And mom's like, yes, yes. I'm like, how did you know? Because you know what? I know it's not in a textbook, but one after another, right? There's a pattern there. So the three-year-olds, my focus, especially in the decade of being in Florida, chocolate or strawberry milk. Flavor milk is a huge thing. Public schools in our country mandate giving milk. And guess what? Nine nine out of 10 kids choose chocolate, strawberry. Yeah, they have an option. Yeah. Yeah. And it's added sugar. That's yeah. what it is, right? I ask the preschoolers really about timing. They're more likely to have bedtime milk and juice. Mm. If it's a 10-year-old, what's beautiful is I can talk to the child. So yeah. we got two people, right? You, yeah. you know, sometimes parents may not want you to know they actually drink three cans of soda a day. Or the the child might be getting, you know, soda or, you know, eating, you know, and the parents just not around or, exactly. you know, and when the kid's 10, my older one's 11 and my younger one's nine. I'm not always watching and monitoring Ugh. what they eat and, and drink oh, all yeah. the time too. So, you know, yeah. the, and I, you know, and I don't feel like I necessarily should be doing that all the time. I mean, I should overall know, but there might be something going on, you know, and then you're like, oh gosh, okay. Then we, we got to stop the candy bar after school every day. You know, what, how are we doing? You know? So Yeah. <laughs> But you're so right, right? I can make it, and this is an entire separate career than being a pediatric ENT surgeon. The truth is, the reason I love and won't fight for every minute of these conversations is you get a 10-year-old, like you just said it, this could be a single mom working two jobs, trying to get by, and she didn't even know what she doesn't know, right? And then the child also shares it. And sometimes, I'll be honest, it's funny how moms become victims in my office. Okay, they get all mad. I yeah. told you, I've tried to tell you to drink water, but you won't listen to me, right? Yeah. So I have to play kind of the, um, whoa, wait, everybody just, let's not pile on the kid, but yeah. also educating both of them so they understand what's driving their choices. And frankly, you just realize nobody's aware. We yeah. get used to what we like. We're not reading the food label. And fundamentally, my job is not to be judgmental and make anybody feel bad is say, no. did you know you shouldn't have more than eight ounces of juice a day? And they yeah. look at you. The eyes are open because when you kind of say to them between one Gatorade, one soda, you drink what? You know, apple juice three times a day. I just did the math for you. Your son just consumed 40 teaspoons of sugar today. And then, by the way, they're there to tell you, I don't know what happened. He put on 10 pounds or 15 pounds this year. This is what the disconnect is for the American public. Yeah. And I I think you make a good point about educating. I mean, and once a kid is, you know, kids, we underestimate kids sometimes. I mean, if you can talk to them and help them understand 
why what they eat and drink and the choices that they can make is important. And, you know, it doesn't have, they actually can really understand and apply it. They're very resilient. I mean, we, we saw that, I feel like, with uh, masking during COVID and school and this and that, where, you know, who, who, who had more problems wearing a mask all day? Not the kids. The kids did fine at school. You know, you, you are is, so correct. You yeah, are so this is correct. why, and this is what we what we have to do. Okay, bye. And and they're they're doing it. it it's a lot of times. So I think um, talking to our patients, especially once they hit a certain age, whether you know, and you you get that rapport. Whether they're sometimes they can be young as five, six, seven. I've you know, and in the way they can you know absorb information or how they ask questions, they're very curious to definitely you know some of our older school age children in an elementary school, and then once they become like. 10, 11, depending on what they're coming in your office for, the rapport, yeah, you make with the parents, but it's our, it's our jobs to have the rapport with our patients who are the 10, 11, 12, because you're going to get that information from them. And that's how you help them. They, you want to gain their trust. So I, I think that, you know, educating everybody in the room and making sure everybody's kind of on the same page of what and why is very important, especially when it comes to the, the lifestyle piece of it. Yeah, and I I love talking to you about this, right? Because you you get it, and we're like sisters, you know, separated at birth. Okay, <laughs> you oh, make me realize how much I miss my teenagers, right? So you ask me three and ten year old, I'm going to tell you when it comes to preteens and teens, mm, there's a whole other layer, right? Yeah. And I'm just going to deviate from this for a second. Let's talk about eating for anybody, yeah. adults, teens. It's tied to emotions, mental health, emotional state. You know how it is. That's why when I used to have horrible days, my husband and daughter know how bad the day is, dependent on if I do the Korean spicy ramen 30 minutes before bedtime while I tell the world not to, because they know it has nothing to do with hunger. It's the some sort of self-abusive yet. Yeah. Mine is yours is ramen noodles. Mine is Ben and Jerry's. Oh, okay. girl, give me the half baked. I want the chocolate chip cookie dough. I want the brownie and I want it in the ice cream. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, right? absolutely. And I'm not sharing. Yeah. My kids know. <laughs> we'll buy um, two. Yeah. yeah. So all joking aside, what I learned with the teenagers is it, it's complicated, right? They yeah. have control of the pantry. The, you know, they have control. They don't even eat. That's a whole other podcast is how they come to me for chronic headache and fatigue. What I learned is, right, the medications, the neurologists, no offense, they don't always work. It's this mysterious, it's the fibromyalgia of 1980s. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, they come in and they're just, they're not doing well in school or between the social isolation, the pandemic. This is a perfect segment to talk about understanding what is going on, then very empathetically and compassionately share, point out to them how this is not making them feel better, right? They don't eat breakfast. They are hypoglycemic. They then don't eat school lunch because it's disgusting, right? Or I don't have time or whatever. And then they get home and they binge. I would too, because I didn't eat all day at work and I come home and I binge. And then they take a four hour nap. Then they stay up late then they're not doing well. Lifestyle is medicine, right? Is what it is. It's how do we encourage our patients and their families to understand it's not some perfect state. It's living with accountability and awareness and say, where can we make small changes one at a time so we can feel better? So we don't just truly believe that by going to a a lot of doctors, which is getting harder and harder for other reasons, you know, we're going to be okay and feel better. That's not, it doesn't happen like that. And I have to say I'm humble by how many parents, moms, patients, especially those that are older, they really want to feel better. Yeah. They say to me, no one's ever explained that to us. No one's ever told us we can do that. And that's really what has inspired me to go down, you know, stay in this space for all this time. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the adolescents because it's a group that I don't want to sound cliche, but yes, uh, misunderstood, hard to connect with. And at the end of the day, they do want to get better in their families, right? At that point, the families don't have as much control or of, of every single choice and their every single thing that they're doing. And they just want their kids to be feeling good and doing well. And so uh, that group 
is a tough group, but if you can connect with them, I think there's a lot there in terms oh. of establishing rapport. It can make you a know, difference. Absolutely. Having a 16 year old daughter, I know I'm going to have you talk to her because she won't <laughs> listen to me about some things. We women are a village. We need to talk to each other's children yes. <laughs> for more effect. But um, I want to, if I can, can I share some very specific stories? I think for clinicians who are listening, absolutely. every patient is a story, right? Absolutely. So when I first, it was just the timing of it worked out when I self-published A Healthier Way with patient stories. This all started very special story, right? A three-year-old Caucasian, medically healthy, you know, came into my office. I'm their seventh specialist. They've seen everyone, Pete's Palm, Pete's GI, Pete's, you know, whatever. Just they show up for recurrent croup. You know your recurrent croup versus yes. a PCNT, right? Yep. And we're like, okay, let's roll out subglottic stenosis. Yeah. Let's do a prom. And it's like, do I take them for a look? Not. There's yeah. no history. Is it really something? Should we just? Yes. yes absolutely. Yes, right. And then, by the way, this one is a non-preemie, never been yeah. intubated. They, they never, okay. They're usually by the time they're three and coming to you, they're, they're otherwise not. healthy. There was no NICU history, no intubation Thank history. You. Thank absolutely. you for validating that patient. Everybody has those. Yes. So he comes in. And so this mom is going on and on. They're on four nebulizers, steroid. And the scary part, you know, he's three years old. They're afraid to sleep at night. They show me a video of what happens when he wakes up. And you know what? It turned out he wasn't even coughing croupy. I mean, he has croupy cough. The videos are of him in laryngospasm. That's what I'm mm. watching, right? He's sucking air. He's awake. And He's got the scary look in his eyes. The parents are putting a neb on him. And what they're telling me is they go to the ER from three to five times a month, but they, they're guaranteed an ambulance ride once a month because this oh is happening gosh. over and over, over for seven months. And you know what I did? I asked about their diet history and milk consumption. And you should have seen the look in this mom. At first, she was almost like, you came highly recommended. I can't yeah. believe we're wasting time talking about this. I mean, what are you talking about? Oh, gosh. And I found out this beautiful three and a half year old drinks chocolate milk seven times a day. Oh, my gosh. Chocolate milk. And I added up. The sh this is very early. You know, when I w this is over a decade, probably a decade ago. Right. So she she said to me, are you kidding me? After mm -hmm. all that we've been through, are you seriously going to tell me chocolate milk is the problem? And I had to, you know, spend that extra time as clinic when later and later explaining sugar dairy, acid reflux. And I finally looked at her. I said, listen, you can leave here and think I'm crazy. I care about you and this child. I would give anything for you guys to sleep and for you never to take an ambulance again. So what do you have to lose? And she, she literally said, you don't understand. If we take away his chocolate milk, we can't live. Like we, you don't understand. <laughs> wow. Because feeding habits are strong, right? If right. a kid doesn't eat, you give them more milk. I mean, you know, they did it within seven days. It was incredible. You know, we, we had a local news story and that wow. did help launch my book and, and the platform and the idea for the milk and cookie disease. So that's an example in a three-year-old. I have countless stories. I've got, I'll just share two more and then we can move on. One is a teenager, right? What we just talked about. And I found out they're on track and field, but they always come in last place. And it's, they came to see me for fatigue, right? Just overall, just I'm not well, then it's a sinus infection. You know, we go there. After modifying, cutting back sugar, emphasizing water, timing, you know, yeah. let's eat healthier, better. Do not eat before your big run. Look at the timing, your training. What time are we having dinner because of practice? This is a big deal for American teens and preteens who are engaged in sports. I do this all day long. Several months later, they came to see me. They're like, we are off of all nebulized treatments. And by the way, she just won her first race. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, look, I don't need to take credit. It's looking at the light and in the faces and knowing that they now have experienced the impact of making decisions to take care of your body. That is like priceless. You know, look at me talking about it. It's just, yeah. The final story is um, when I give a lot of grand rounds, which I've been yeah. um, blessed to do, I share video and photos. I had a kid come in for hoarseness, right? Ten-year-old mom was, you know, very lovely woman, medically healthy. And she said his voice is horrible. I checked him out. Not much real, any findings for vocal cord nodules, actually. Yeah. But the diet, oh my goodness, soda, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, no water ever. 
the kind of foods we're talking about, you can imagine the go- yogurts, the pizzas. Okay, and mom then said, I went back to school to get my MP degree. We used to, I used to cook a lot. I, I don't. And I can tell you, this is somebody out there listening knows what I'm talking about. We're busy. But I noticed his skin, the worst eczema, scabs everywhere, bleeding. Mom says he's, he can't sleep. He wakes up scratching. And then Gopi, you know, I've had problem with histamine release. It's now been worse since I had COVID last October. If you've ever been itchy and feel like your body's on fire, you know, it's horrific. So how odd, I'm not a dermatologist, but I have seen repeatedly when we reduce sugar because sugar fuels inflammation systemically. And I have a small pilot study that show that. And basically within four weeks, right? I I video recorded his voice. I show this in my talks, but it was his eczema that I documented at four weeks and eight. He started sleeping through the night. They all scabbed and healed. Once we cut out the tremendous amount of sugary drinks that are in aisle 12, the entire aisle, aisle 13, you know, at your grocery store. Mm. This is possible. This is possible in a country where we're getting sicker and it's getting harder and harder to get to a physician. So I'm glad you brought up the pilot study because that was going to be my next question. One was, is there data out there in terms of diet and some of the pediatric otolaryngology problems that, you know, that we see? Um, And my second follow-up question was going to be, what sources for those of us that want to learn a little bit more about, you know, how diet, sleep, exercise, all that can play a role in our our kids, uh, what sources are there as well? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'm not sure I'm the <laughs> the best person. I certainly don't have formal education or titles to to recommend that. I think for the pediatric otolaryngologist listening, right? We we know about AAP guidelines. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think making yourself familiar, for example, right? No juice less than 12 months, no more than 4 ounces from age, you know, this to that. And even if you're school age, it should be never more than eight ounces from age seven to 18, right? So being familiar with, you know, screen time recommendation, right? Sleep is a whole bag of worms, but it's really about sleep hygiene, right? I It breaks my heart how quickly we put children on melatonin, right? Because pills are easier than, re- or, and some of it, I'm not blaming physicians. We are so pressured for productivity. You just don't have the time. Because yeah. I'm thinking what I, I frankly, I'm like, well, what are the pediatricians talking about? So either they do share all that. And like you said, we just it's on a piece of paper. No one looks at it again. So I think, you know, that's initially my sources would be PubMed. Right. I would search. I read. I try to not just our scientific evidence based clinical practice guidelines. But as you know, nowadays, you, you can Google, you can read news. You know, be careful of the headlines, right? Study shows, you know what I'm talking about every day, whether it's New York Times, Wall Street, your Apple News is feeding you, study shows this and that. I had the privilege of partnering with our past associate dean at UCF College of Medicine, Dr. Partha Sarathi. I still miss him greatly. He is a renowned cardiovascular researcher. I'll be honest with you, Gopi, a lot of my small projects looking at diet and cough, sinonasal quality of life improvement after dietary habits, we students and I would present this at Centac, even at ASPO. When it came time to publish, I got rejected over and over. Anything that had to do with diet, and I'm not saying I'm a perfect researcher. I think you understand that I get it. It's not mainstream. People are uncomfortable. They're very critical. It's hard to do studies that impact behavior, that involve modifying what you're doing, right? That's yeah. very different type of research. But the one thing we did in our pilot study, which despite multiple attempts, we published in a non-ENT journal, it was just looking at preschoolers, you know, two to four weeks, decreasing their sugary, su- sugar-sweetened beverages and counseling and showing that we measured lipid profile, inflammatory markers for pro-inflammation and anti-inflammatory interleukins, and It was eye-opening. You know, it was not powered enough. People dropped out because it required blood draw. So for preschoolers, you can imagine my... Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Like a single stick. That's why you make sure you (laughs) 
you know, a single stick is a big deal. Trust it me, is. I, I totally get it. But mm-hmm. I will tell you what we found based on the limited data, you know, even though it didn't have as many subjects in it as we, what was shocking was that none of these were o- overweight, high BMI. They were normal size preschoolers who were consuming a ton of sugary beverages. And we compare them to ear tube kids who did not. I wouldn't have guessed that juice or sugar sweetened beverages would impact your uh, triglyceride. Who would have known that? Even in a two-week period. So what we saw, there were definite trends, including impact to alpha TNF levels. But the big thing was, if you cut sugar-sweetened beverages and sugar, right, you de- we saw pro-inflammatory markers drop. Anti-inflammatory markers went up. Um, and I'm sad that we lost Dr. Partha Sarathi. Um, we did apply for an R21 grant. I try, Gopi, I try. We, <laughs> we, 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 you know, I'm not a career-trained um, researcher, but I always had dreams. Yeah, well, I think um, making you this, bring up a good know. point with collaborating, right? I think, yeah. uh, especially in the pediatric odor world, we're so fortunate to have partners and uh, multidisciplinary. Everything is very much uh, team-approached and um if we work with our colleagues um, that are in, whether it's pediatric cardiology, pediatric pulmonology, our pediatricians who mm-hmm. really are the front line, right, mm-hmm. of our, for our kids, I think that there's an entire resource there. And I'll be honest, like, until you really said it, as a pediatric otolaryngologist, I don't, I haven't, you know, utilized the AAP guidelines as much. I look at all of our academy guidelines mm-hmm. and, you know, our consensus statements, which have been so helpful, especially in the last 10 years. But that is a the AAP guidelines is something that I need to be a little bit more up to date to personally and, and should be kind of keeping up with those uh, resources for sure. And then, you know, you, you mentioned modifying behavior change. And yes, it, it's going to take a modifying behavior change for me as a clinician to make sure I understand those guidelines and how to a- apply them as my patients come in. But I think that the, you know, on the family side of it, you know, it's small, consistent behavior changes that we're asking families of, hey, we got to cut the chocolate milk down or we have to, you know, before bedtime. How do you counsel patients? I mean, I I don't think I appreciated the difficulty more. It was more with my, um, I noticed it with my TNA kids that would have residual OSA Mm -hmm. and, you know, many of them, most of them would have a weight problem. And I just didn't know how to talk to them about it. How do you learn to counsel families and help them be consistent because it's not going to, it's not a pill. It's not something that after I sign this paper and I've read it, the problem's going to be gone. It, it's a consistent change. It's a way of life. So h- yeah. how did you learn about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's multi-prong what I learned to do, right? One is that after visit summary, you know, if your health system uses, like, right, if you're on Epic or whatever platform, before you leave the office, we always print a handout. I know we're killing trees, right? What I learned to do is to incorporate information in there because I can talk all day long and it's a reinforcement. And if I type dot AVS, you know, uh, MCD, milk and cookie disease, this yeah. entire thing comes out, right? That I took the time to type out with very clear bullet points of suggestions. So let me say this, right? I am not a trained counselor, but I, I would argue that as physicians, because all we do is talk to patients all day right. long. Inherently, we've we've learned that skill. Just have conversations. Don't get overwhelmed. Think about what are the, you know, if you could do nothing else, here's here's the top thing I like you to try. And by the way, this is not forever, right? We're gonna know within a few weeks this either helps or it doesn't. If nothing changes, you're either gonna come back. I need to put on my Dr. ENT hat, do that diagnostic bronc or whatever else I'm doing. So I want to make sure the audience does not think Julie Way is a one-trick pony and then just, you know, think that I'm a hammer that it, this works for everything. Right. So parents are very open to trying something when you tell them it's for a short duration, non-invasive, maybe hard, take several, you know, expectation that it takes several days to adopt. And if it doesn't, no harm. It's not because your child is bad or you're a bad parent, right? So I learned to talk to them that way. Let me make a shift. You brought up a whole huge topic. I mean, we as PZ and T's, right? We're the experts on managing sleep disorder, breathing, OSA, not just medically, surgically, everything to do with evaluation. The most frustrating group of patients, I mean, I know I can't be alone, is when they come to you, they've already had their TNA, they've had their terminal plasty, they've had their sleep endoscopy, 
and whether they're overweight or have elevated BMI or not, doesn't matter. You're like, oh, great. <laughs> what do I do yeah, now? Right? Absolutely. Am I really going to recommend the jaw advancement? Are we really going to cut our way out of this? With I'm not disrespecting all the talks I've heard and the beautiful images of all these surgical invasive treatments. Or is a CPAP for life, which you know in children, it's just, I feel like that's, I would never wish that on anyone, yeah. right? So this is where I have found trying to say, hey, listen, you're already on Flonase. People have given you Singulair, Flonase, every medicine that, you know, there've been some proven limited benefit, et cetera. That's where I encourage, we need to try a few things here. Get that humidifier. Stop eating two hours before bed to activate the parasympathetics and nasal congestion. You got to get some activity, sailing irrigation, right? But you got to help me. I want to help you. Otherwise, somebody somewhere is going to offer you another surgery. And I, I don't think that's the answer. Not lifelong when you're only 13, 15, 17. So I think that the counseling I've learned through just simply sharing, I tell them what I don't know. There's a lot I don't know. I tell them what I do know and what I have seen. And yeah. then we follow up. And the ones, you know, I learn from those who follow up. I'm sure they're out there, parents who thought I was crazy and they never came back. So I don't know if I, they got better. Wait, but we all have those. <laughs> you're being You're not kind. alone. <laughs> yeah, but l I'll tell you, you just try it. I encourage the listeners. This is humbling. You know, I was in a busy day. Um, it's been a year since I practiced, so it's heartbreaking for me to even look back. I'm in my busy, you know how your OR days, you may have 12 cases, 13. And then I come to the bedside to consent for ear tubes. And the mom said, by the way, I want to thank you. I'm thinking, for what? We haven't even started. She said, you remember you told me to stop the bedtime milk? And I'm, of course, thinking, uh, I tell that to everyone. I don't quite remember. I just kind of smile. She goes, I want to tell you, oh my gosh, we have a different kid. We have not had to be on medicine. We haven't gone to urgent care. We not da, 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 da. we haven't been on antibiotics. That is a huge one for me. Yeah, we haven't been on. And when I hear that, I feel good. You know, ear tube is great, but I feel good that this parent feels empowered. And it's not forever, by the way. You get older. You love cow milk. You know, what? <laughs> yeah. nothing is you know permanent, right? It's just for now to get rid of symptoms to live a better life. These are the things I know to, yeah. that I share. Yep. Absolutely. So I just want to do like a little recap just okay. so that I'm a little organized in my head. Yep. So for my kids that come in with chronic cough, chronic runny nose congestion, I'm going to be a little bit more diet focused in their history. And then my kids, the OSA kids, or you know, so maybe more of my older kids that are like school aged uh, and older. I'm going to think about diet, exercise, and sleep. Is that kind of how you organize it in your mind? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's an excellent way to, yep. I, I get a little more into, especially because they, the older they are, they directly influence their sleep, right? Okay. A two-year-old, you can put to bed at eight, right? But a 16-year-old, yep. So making sure they're part of the conversation. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And then another good information piece would be my, my AAP guidelines, just about overall intake, exercise, screen time, just to kind of in my mind have those little bubbles in my head. And then I liked how you went through the questions that you have for uh, milk intake, the amount, the type, is it at bedtime, the amount of sugary beverages and yogurt. So those are kind of the bullet points of yes. just kind of get my feet wet and just to have something to kind of start with. Absolutely. Now, okay. this is an aside, and I, I know that, um, well, talking to you is so fun. Time is flying quickly. <laughs> you know what I learned? You and I, people, right, PZ and T's, we see a lot of very medically complex children. This yeah. is fascinating. I just want to point this out. I don't know. I, I'm not a, I didn't do a comprehensive randomized clinical trial, right? We take care of a lot of trach. G tube dependent children. So it turns out, I didn't know till practicing the last 19 years that in our country, parents are taught to give continuous tube feeding at night when they're sleeping because they tell me then it doesn't interfere. It's easier. It's just easier. And they would come see me for gagging, choking, sleep apnea, yeah. you know, because oh, they, they have dysphagia, can't clear their secretions sort of anyways, right? But they're having these scary choking episodes. We're having to suction the nose nonstop. 
So then I started paying attention to that. And then about, I would say, easily about a decade ago, I could be wrong with the timing, when I first heard about blenderized diet, which is taking, you know, instead of the, I won't, like Pediasure, right, those things that I just find have high osmolality, high sugar content, some of them, long story short, you may not have a choice because based on your medical comorbidity, the GI has decided this is your nutrition source. But what I learned, and I'm not the one who tell them whether they can or not, so I want to be clear. I just encourage the families to have a conversation with the GI. Those who are on bolus feeding, not continuous, because that's more physiologic to how humans eat, right? And those who can have their feeding in the daytime, not during sleep, when you're supine, you want to talk yeah. about even if you have a Nissen fundal plication, right? It, it, you, so the point is less symptoms, less gagging, vomiting, retching, rhinorrhea, all the parasympathetic activation when they are on either blenderized diet, bullets, or daytime. So not a reality for everyone, but I found that to be very interesting. Another non-simple project, but but you know these families, you know the emotional burden for all for them and for us taking care of them. Something small like, oh, we found our congestion a lot better. We aren't okay, gagging every five minutes. That was priceless for that family. Yeah. Before we kind of uh, start wrapping up, I want to talk about your. You have an online course for parents. Oh, <laughs> yes. Tell me about that, and then I want to talk about the books. Oh, thank you for giving me the <laughs> shout out. Absolutely. I have probably over 70 blogs and I welcome anyone, you know, some of them picked up a lot of steam before the revamp. You know, at one point, this is going to sound braggy. I was very proud of myself being non-techie to have had over 450,000 views on my website annually. I put a lot of blogs there. Top four reasons my kid is congested, snores, whatever. The parent for parents, because I know it's very hard, right? My medical colleagues and surgical colleagues may not adopt my perspective. So in 2018, I did create three online courses, one for cough, one for rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, and one for acid reflux, hoping that, you know, everything we've talked about in this podcast are kind of contained there so that if it helps them, wonderful. And yeah, that, that's the reason I launched those three online courses. That's awesome. And then tell me about a healthier way and acid reflux uh, in children. Yeah, thank you. So A Healthier Away was self-published. I learned a lot. Um, this was, again, just, I decided, oh, actually, I'll be honest with you. You know what made me write it? I've always had digestive issues, very much correlated with stress and internalization of stress. I had this horrific post-viral gastroparesis in 2012. Mm. For six to eight weeks, um, I really thought I was going to die. You know, I'm at the university. I saw the GI. I got scoped. I got blood work. No one can tell me why, but worse, they couldn't treat it. So if I took a sip of water, I vomited. And I just thought, I can't believe I'm going to die, right? Um, you know what cured me? You know, <laughs> I put this in the book. My mom died when I was nine and a half from breast cancer, but I reflected on my Taiwanese heritage and how culturally anybody in the hospital, you bring chicken broth, right? Mm. Cook with shiitake mushroom or chicken. And I thought about when I had a fever as a child, my mom got me the fresh coconut. I would drink, you know, now they're like $4 a bottle <laughs> like at the grocery store, but coconut water because it was electrolyte. So I really wrote that. That book was inspired with personal and professional stories. Looking at, you know, I have patients that, you know, provided examples and just my commentary about at that time, 10 years ago, my observation of the U.S. health system care delivery, well-intended, but there were gaps. And then I even made my first documentary trailer. So for oh, wow. the listeners, if you go to Vimeo and search, The Kitchen is Closed. The Kitchen is Closed, Dr. Julie Wei. You'll see my five minute. I'm really proud of it. I worked, wrote, you know, this, this is a, my little film documentary. I just need to raise money to make the big feature film. So that book, I still sell from my garage, <laughs> um, wow. fulfillment through Amazon. And then the second book, Acid Reflux in Children, um, I have to thank Dr. Jamie Kaufman and Dr. Karen Zer. Dr. Kaufman is renowned, award-winning author, right? Legacy for bringing awareness and research findings on acid reflux in, in adults for otolaryngology. But she was interested for a book specifically on children. 
So Karen Zer and I contributed. Karen focused a lot on infancy, formula, acidity, and baby products and early in life. I focus a lot more on then the school age, the teens, specifically sharing my observations and experience on timing and symptoms. So both books are available on Amazon since you mentioned it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Any final pearls on this topic that you want to leave our listeners with? Oh, um, wow. First of all, I wish our listeners and their own children and their families better health, good health, strong health for this year and forward. The second probably would just say, you know, be curious. And, and before you decide this is all nonsense, which you have the right to, just start little. Ask two questions every time you see a child. And then that may grow to three and try it. If you try it, I think um, you would be amazed. And that adds to your armamentarium and toolbox. And what physician doesn't wouldn't like something else in the toolbox that is non-invasive and effective and differentiate you from someone else. And most of all, you know, help a child and help a family reclaim better health. Well, thank you so much, Julie. For our listeners, don't forget to check out the Vimeo, The Kitchen is Closed trailer, A Healthier Way, um, as well as Acid Reflux in Children on Amazon. Check out the online courses. We say they're for parents, but I guarantee you it's something that uh, (laughs) we would learn plenty from as well. For our listeners, for stopping by, thank you for tuning in. Uh, You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, Ghana, Apple Podcasts, and we look forward to the next time. It's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Orvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.